Well, let's jump in. Like, we got to talk M&A stuff. We're done with the summer, almost, unofficially, but I'll, kids are back in school. We're done with the summer. We've talked about three things really impacting this space. Strong balance sheets, patent cliffs, policy clarity really impacting M&A, especially from the big boys. In general, what's going on in the M&A space? What are you excited about? What stands out to you right now? Yeah, Jeff, we actually had a pretty major development in the M&A landscape, and uh, it, it was a favorable outcome for Amgen's $28 billion purchase of Horizon Therapeutics. So just as a reminder to folks, um, the FTC stepped up and challenged this deal. It's the first one in you know, probably 15 or more years um, since FTC has legally challenged a, a kind of pharma biotech M&A deal. And... Um, the news was that um, FTC has decided to fold its hand and settle the case. So basically, they're allowing the merger to proceed on the original financial terms without modification with some, you know, very minor concessions from Amgen in terms of, you know, a pledge not to acquire other competitors in, in, in the spaces where they have major assets um, and uh, some, some minor things. Uh, and, you know, not to get too deep in the weeds on the legal argument, but just uh, just to give folks a little bit of a flavor for what the rub was here. You know, FTC, uh, Jonathan, was trying to advance really a novel uh, theory in terms of um, why they wanted to block the merger. And that was that Amgen could theoretically bundle their own drugs and offer discounts with those drugs and the ones they were acquiring from Horizon. Um, and, you know, Amgen was very articulate in their, their legal briefing, which came out just, you know, a week before FTC folded its hand. Um, and, and I don't think that was a coincidence because, you know, Amgen laid out very clearly um, that it really it, it was impossible for them to bundle these drugs, even if they wanted to, because the drugs come from two different benefit programs. Right? There's mm-hmm. medical benefit drugs, and there's pharmacy benefit drugs. They, they're, they're, they're completely different benefit systems. Um, and uh, you know, pharmacy benefit drugs um, are are more commonly rebated, and, and you know they they um, they go through different channels, et cetera. Uh, medical benefit drugs are administered typically by physicians that are purchased by the physician. And the physician is the one that is um, um, uh, their reimbursement for the physician administering the drug is associated with the sale price of the drug that they purchased it for, or the average mm-hmm. selling price called ASP. Right. So if you're going to rebate against a, a medical benefit drug. You're reducing the reimbursement rate that the physician is getting. So you're disincentivizing the physician. And in a landscape where a physician has has um, access to drugs with rebates or not, um, they're, they're going to want to go you know, with the, the highest average selling price net because that's what affects their reimbursement. So nobody's mm-hmm. doing this bundling today. It was ridiculous for FTC to advance the claim. And you know, it, was, it was really uh, you know, no concession on Amgen's part to just voluntarily say, hey, we're not going to do this. Because even if they wanted to do it, when they couldn't, two, it wouldn't be logistically possible. And three, it wouldn't make economic sense. Right. OK. Well, but we did see this play into this you know, siege in Pfizer's all over the news. What are the carryover effects of this? How is it going to impact that deal in particular and maybe others in the future? Yeah, so I think the take home message is, is that, um, uh, you know, M&A rules are validated um, and the precedents for M&A rules have been, you know, reaffirmed. And so, you know, I think there's more clarity on the acquirer's perspective into in terms of what types of deals are, are allowed to go forward and, and, you know, what they feel like they can do. And if you look at, you know, how the market responded in terms of pricing, so the deal spread for the Ambient Horizon merger closed within 1%. So the market is basically mm-hmm. saying, hey, this is a done deal now. It's uh, not even a 1% arbitrage left. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a small Irish court filing that has to go through. There's no expectation that that won't go the right way. So um, that's where that one is. And the Seijin uh, Pfizer deal has closed to within 10%. So this deal was trading mm-hmm. at a much wider margin. So you know, investors were looking to the Horizon Amgen FTC litigation as a proxy for what might Pfizer expect to see, you know, down the road. And, you know, because I think, um, you know, again, uh, you know, the, the legacy standards for what constitutes, um, you know, a, a reasonable merger in FTC's eyes were affirmed. Obviously, the Pfizer um, Seattle deal spread is tightened as a result. Hey, policy clarity, that's one of our three-legged stools, one of the important parts of it. So we like to see uh, clarity, and we like to see it often, <laughs> which is a big deal. Well, for sure. And Jonathan, think about going forward now, right? So if you're a BD team, 
and and you know with this result in your back pocket you feel more confident um you know going forward and making bids right i mean you know i'm sure some companies are more comfortable dealing with complex litigation than others but you know uh, you know if if you're if you're making decisions on corporate strategy and you're worried about being mired in some multi-year legal process or some prolonged legal process with with uncertain outcome you know, it, it, it makes it harder for you to move forward strategically. So I think mm. this is good. We're going to see more deals. Um, um, we're a little disappointed we haven't seen one yet. I don't know if it's been just a few days since this announcement. So we need a little more time than that. But uh, we're going to see more before the end of the year. And I think um, having this in the rearview mirror is definitely a positive and a tailwind for the sector. Well, let's move away from the FTC and maybe the FBA. But big news today from Synetics with the ticker CRNX. I just saw my news, 65% pop in a matter of minutes what happened there yeah so it's a company called Crenetics. um, um uh, exciting story here jonathan so they're developing what would be you know an oral alternative to manage patients with acromegaly um this is a, a difficult you know, sort of endocrine based disease and the data they showed really exceeded analyst expectations they had you know well over 80 percent of patients on the therapy um, as they transition from an injectable therapy, maintain their insulin-like growth factor one levels. This is the, uh, you know, sort of the hormone that gets out of balance um, uh, with these patients uh, versus 4% in the placebo arm. So well over a 70% uh, delta, which again was was above the high end of expectations on, on, on the street and certainly the medical community. So this this uh, therapy now with this data in hand, safety profile look great, you know, uh, some other secondary endpoints look really good. So. Uh, you know, I think that um, the the view of, of the street now is that, you know, this really is in the catbird seat to be the best in class therapy for managing these patients. And, you know, this could be quite a large opportunity uh, from a market perspective. So, you know, seeing a stock move up 65 percent, it's recognizing and rewarding um, the value of the data that the company delivered. Hey, that that's another one of those parts of the uh, three legged stool we like to see It's good, uh, good balance sheets, policy clarity, and then the patent clips coming up. All right, I have to ask you because I promise we're always going to ask you. Obesity drugs are always in the news. You and I were talking earlier. I've never seen anything, or you've never seen anything where this one drug impacts all these other tentacles in these niche. You said niche markets. Like, how, what's going on? Like, how is this impacting it? What's the play here? What What should we be thinking about as investors, more or less? Yeah, Jonathan. So the you know the the rise of the you know GLP one uh, class of drugs to manage obesity is now reverberating in multiple subsectors of the healthcare space. So what we've seen you know in recent weeks is you know companies that provide services for diabetic patients in terms of medical devices and other services are selling off dramatically uh, with the narrative of. If GLP-1 use is increasing and better managing these patients, they're not going to have as much of a need for these other services. So, so companies that um, you know provide insulin pumps, for example, you know, hey, if patients are better managed on GLP-1s, perhaps you might, might delay the number of that might need to be on insulin pump-based therapies or or the timing of that um, uh, initiation of therapy. You know, glucose monitoring, which is an adjacent. Um, you know, sort of uh, medical device and, and, you know, multiple others. So these are just a couple mm -hmm. examples. And, you know, there's a debate going on both in academic uh, medicine uh, and in the investment community of, of, around how big of an impact this is going to be. And, you know, partly we don't completely know, right, because we haven't mm -hmm. seen, you know, these uh, drugs be rolled out completely yet, although we have some tidbits of information. And, right. and you know, there, there's definitely some suggestion that, you know, there's going to be some changes overall. But, you know, we're in early innings, but I, I, I got to tell you, I, you know, some wild stock moves out there um, that we're seeing. And, uh, you know, it, like, I think you said it well. It's unusual to see one drug class, uh, you know, change so many different subsectors simultaneously. Yeah. Well, interesting times. I think you've, you've said it oftentimes. Just, you got to be careful with what you own, right? Like, you, it's hard to throw that big net out because there's so many binary outcomes and so many things that are contingent on stuff we don't know about that's out of our hands. So it's it's wise to be wise, for lack of a better saying well, or anything like that. And I think to that point, Jonathan, right? So, you know, in, in our sector, we have the largest standard deviation of return uh, of any other sector. So th there's a high variability yeah. of, of price. And that's because, uh, you know, there's a lot of success and failure in drug discovery development, et cetera. But th there's also 
uh, you know, as as the landscape changes and the fundamentals change in terms of how patients are managed um, or new new product entrants or or new uses of products, et cetera, you know, that can affect markets materially. So, you know, the fact pattern changes. So, it, you know, it, it just may be that, you know, staying in front of the, uh, you know, the actual frontier of medical practice, um, you know, can get you, um, you know, out of trouble in terms of, uh, you know, uh, not getting a drawdown or taking advantage of an updraft, um, you know, if you're ahead of the curve. Right. Well, thanks as always for your time, Mark. Really appreciate it. Kept you away from the uh, trading portal too too long. Time for you to get back after it. It's open hours, but thanks. Appreciate everybody for joining us and we'll be back next time or join us on the third Thursday. So third Thursday of every month for doctor is in. It's a great call. 10, 15 minutes. Uh, uh, put it on your calendar and don't miss it. Thanks again, Mark. Appreciate your time today. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks everybody.